welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people. All the while, reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 134. This is one of your co-hosts, Mark Fernandes, in my usual chair, and our guest who will be talking to you soon just identified, and people don't get to see this video much, but I am sitting in a very blue room, but it's a kind blue. It's not a sad blue. It's a happy blue. One of my favorite colors anyway, so all about it today. And since I use the color blue, we're going to go from blue to pink because that's Eric's favorite color. Eric DeRosa across the creek in his usual seat as well. My pinkest friend, the person who likes pink. And look, I've got a lot of friends who love pink, including we were just talking about our good friend who has a younger son who's a phenomenal guitar player. Pink is one of his favorite colors. He's in a high socks pink. That's how he rocks. So are we feeling pink today? I'm feeling pink today. Pink toenails. And yes, such an array of pink ski poles to bikes, you name it and yeah, you know it. You got uh, it. Pink everywhere. Your blue room reminds me uh, because I'm slowly starting to think about Maui, which is now only three months away and a little bit like a blue Hawaiian, which is an amazing tasty drink. It is. My it does have that. Yeah. James, yeah. My friend James makes for us at the pool. And it's it's going to be curacao. Delicious. It is curacao that's in there. Curacao. And it's it's absolutely delicious. Uh, Color that I'm, doesn't exist in nature. No. <laughs> but I'm good. It's great to see you. I, uh, As I continue to do a whole lot of things in my life that I've never done before and jump in the deep end and continue to try to swim, I submitted the first draft of my book chapter this morning. Congratulations. To, to uh, my editor and waiting for... That thing to turn around, the book launch. I don't even think I've talked about it on the podcast. No, not yet. uh, I've been asked to write in a book called From Scars to Stars. It's the third volume of the book, and it's a collaborative effort. I think there's 18 authors in in this version, and the book launch will be on September 22nd, and I'm excited for that. I'm even, I know we were chatting before we came on, I, I don't have the first thing or knowledge about uh, book tours or book signings or any of these things. But I am hoping uh, at the very least to be able to do a book signing at the Barnes and Noble in Maui when I'm there uh, in late October. So that'd be kind of cool bringing all those worlds together because that's where I mark where the original uh, ideas for this podcast came from. So bringing it like full circle with everything. So how are you? I know a bit of a stressful morning, but your mom was here and it was amazing to get to spend time with her. It's frequent uh, for you, but it's kind of few and far between for me these days. And when she comes, I really love to see her. Yeah, we only get her to Colorado once a year. But yeah, like you said, like I'm, and this year I actually get to see her more than ever because we have a family wedding coming up, another trip back in New York, and then I will uh, make my now annual pilgrimage down to sunny Arizona for Thanksgiving and our Thanksmas, as we like to call it, because I don't get to see my nieces and nephews at Christmas. So we use that as our time. So yeah, no, it was great. It was great to see her. She was super excited. It was the first big party I'd hosted at my house really since COVID. And it was awesome. And I kept telling everyone that it was just so great to see everyone at the same time. And I know by some people's margins, it wouldn't be huge. But yeah, we had close to 40 people over and many of them knew my mom. So it was great for her to see everybody. And then a few people got to meet her for the first time. So it was great. But you know, an absolute whirlwind trying to balance work. And for anyone out there listening, if you are really trying to figure out how to stress your brain in a like a logistics and planning situation, host a teenager and her grandmother at the same time. It's it's an interesting exercise in trying to like keep everybody in play. <laughs> well, you did a great job. First of all, the party was amazing. And you're right. Amy and I were, were thinking back. And it's really the first time you had an organized group of people at your house since we all found out on March 14th of 2020 that the ski season was being shut down and it was, and that was maybe a quarter of the number of people. It was really fun. The kids concert, which they performed uh, a set of Nirvana was amazing. 
And yeah, you pulled it off spectacularly with your mom and your niece and capped it off with a concert at Red Rocks, which I know was on her her bucket list. So, yeah, and she um, got to see a bunch of lightning and rainbows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all rainbows and unicorns, right? Well, enough about our life because I really want to bring in today's guest because she is truly an amazing human being and shares New York with me and you and I think LA with you, Mark. I've never lived in LA. But joining us today is Susan Gold. Navigating a ferociously challenging upbringing while bravely moving forward as an adult to face ingrained, outdated, and patriarchal programming head on, Susan now shares a unique perspective in viewing life challenges as occasions for transformation. Through her book, Toxic Family Transforming Childhood Trauma into Adult Freedom, Susan turns the standard paradigm on its head, courageously leading others to her own journey of abuse, addiction, and surviving narcissism, all while creating a distinctly empowering personal and professional life. Keen on leaving a legacy to help others heal from challenges she's successfully met, Toxic Family is part of that quest. With the same magic Susan created in her entertainment career, she is now leading retreats, webinars, workshops, and private sessions to help others drop outdated storylines and programming in exchange for living from the heart in authentic freedom as adults. She is a decorated endurance athlete competing in three marathons and dozens of triathlons and has the distinction of finishing third in her age group at the treacherous Escape from Alcatraz event, supporting homeless animals, especially dogs and cats, and helping others up the ladder are her joys. With that, let's welcome in from up north, really close to the border of Canada in Montana, Susan Gold. Thank you so much for joining us today. Wow, what an amazing welcome that was. And that was an amazing repartee you had going there, Eric. I was in, <laughs> it's you. I was it's, in Ma- it's you. <laughs> I was in Maui at the Barnes and Noble waiting for the book. It won't be it won't be that quick. But actually you'll be here and then you'll be I in Maui be a few weeks after. Yep. I will be in Maui. Uh, yeah. The tour will be beginning on uh, October 17th. Yeah. I'll be in Maui. Awesome. Uh, yeah. The last two weeks of October. Fantastic. Hidden away. Yes. Well, Susan, listening to your bio, first off, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us and chat with us today. I'm super excited. And But it's something Eric and I've shared. Obviously, Eric has shared his whole story. I've shared bits of mine. And it's funny. We just talked about having my mom here. And my mom and I had some really interesting chats about different things in childhood and sort of generational trauma and the awareness or sort of overcoming it, right? And my mom made, and I have to give her a huge compliment for this, she made this huge statement and about how she knows so much more about what she was trying to put herself through or to figure out when she was raising me now than when she was raising me. And she didn't go as far to be like, oh, I'm sorry I was like that, or and because I wouldn't want her to do that because she did an incredible job with what she had at the moment, which is all we can do. But I was just wondering, listening to your bio and and that sort of sense is, where is it that we sort of have to start, right? Because I one of the reasons why I haven't shared my whole story at times is because it isn't just mine. And I don't feel comfortable necessarily sharing the other parts of it that really involve others. And sometimes for me, that could be difficult to untangle. Like, where do I start with my own story with where it begins, where it ends? And, and how do we help heal ourselves that way? Yeah, that's a great question. And I never thought I would write a book like this. And Toxic Family was not my title. It's my publisher's title and she's genius and she's great with marketing. My title was Magical Illumination, Transforming Childhood Trauma. Well, that's a little bit different. Freedom. (laughs) Yeah. And that's how I feel about it now, right? But Toxic Family is going to draw the reader that needs to read this book. And it it was brutal just really making that decision. Am I going to go forth and really tell the truth? because that was not encouraged. And I love my parents. I have tremendous respect for the trauma that they experienced. And it was hurt and abused children, raising hurt and abused children. I mean, my mother's father was beaten almost to the point of death. My father's father was a big Peter Pan and he didn't really want kids. So his mom compensated. And it is 
trauma in the ancestry. And yeah, I had a great career and met a lot of people that glitter like gold. But honestly, this is my purpose. This is my reason for taking the walk that I have to really start this taboo conversation around this intense topic and tell truth to clear toxicity out of family lineage. And something you said, and I'm going to, I'm going to change a little word for you. I'm going to be an editor for a second because you were saying telling the truth, but the reality was this was your first time and your first chance to tell your truth, something which you hadn't been able to do before. Oh my God. It's uh, yeah. Okay. Can I cry now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, and would it be the first time and it don't be the last? I'm actually usually the one that tears up. The big hairy guy over here is the sensitive soul, but it, it is. And, and I guess that's what led me to that question of where does it sort of begin and end and reading between the lines of your answer. It, it doesn't, right. It is, it, it's really, it's a moving target. And I think for me, like, my mom overcame so much in her life just to have survived alone in some ways was a huge achievement and to have raised kids held jobs still be walking on the planet is pretty awesome and i think that's why and it's funny because my mom and i are super close and eric can tell you we man we still fight we we are not afraid to butt heads and we care really deeply for each other so if one of us thinks the other person isn't doing the right thing or isn't showing up authentically. We will, <laughs> we are harder on ourselves and each other than we would be on anyone, but it really comes from this place of deep care. But it made me realize that if there is trauma involved and decisions are being made or you're reacting sort of emotionally or from a place of habit versus with intent, it's so easy for that to get so much worse and to just, propagate that same sort of behavior and continue. And I think that's what led me to this idea of, I kind of knew the answer was going to be like, we don't know, but it's, you have to start somewhere, right? I, unless you want to walk around in a false persona. And I don't know if anybody a, wants to do that on purpose. I'm not sure. Yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. They might, not, they it's, might. It's not an easy walk to begin with, but to have to pretend Ouch. And that brings in so much illness, right? Into our being. So, but it does take a lot of bravery to break out of the construct and step out of the old faulty matrix that's broken and try it differently. And so I guess we'll, we'll kind of jump off, think with this concept and the idea of healing is a continuum, right? So Whenever it starts, it just continues, it morphs, it changes, it's a journey, and we'll be on that journey until we are no longer physically on this planet. And without giving up too much of what's in Toxic Family, because we want our audience to be able to go back and, and purchase that book and read in detail everything that you laid out, what, what would you say were some of the key defining moments backing into your childhood that led you onto this mental health journey, the road of addiction, as you talked about, before you were able to take a step back and t be able to tell your own truth? It was a crazy, chaotic home. My dad is a genius astrophysicist. But he was also like popping the whiskey bottle cork at 7.30 a.m. and glug, 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 glug. And had a little bit of sexual addiction and a little bit of narcissism. And my mom had five kids before she was 30, married to Peter Pan. And her turn at higher education never came. So she felt saddled and she soothed with food. So back then... They helped that issue with diet pills. And guys, like I was in my mid twenties before I realized diet pills, speed. So I was raised by an alcoholic and a speed freak with a mental health condition, I believe. And my mom could be incredibly loving, like really super soothing and wonderful. And the next moment she's beating me and I have no idea what I did. So that, that home life was terrifying. I was 
PTSD, stressed out, central nervous system running on overdrive. But I also was very strong in the fact that I was going to get out of there and I was going to make something of myself. I used to watch Barbara Walters on the beanbag chair in my basement on my belly at 10 and go, I'm going to New York City. Like I was in a little podunk town in central Pennsylvania and I just wanted out and I wanted to go to New York City and I wanted to do something in the business side of entertainment. And that kind of surly focus really kept me going. It is interesting. We've, it seems like this has come up a lot lately. You know, I'm thinking specifically talking about the music industry recently and this idea of like how often the drive or that initial push to either become a former an entertainer, write a book is to kind of heal or to, to kind of spackle a hole in ourselves, so to speak, for lack of a better term. But there is a, but there is a sense of it. And I've certainly had this experience myself that that hole doesn't get filled by achievement. It gets filled with self-awareness and healing and therapy. And where was it or how was it that you finally realized that no matter what you were able to achieve and no matter how dynamic of a human you could be, there were still things that the bricks inside needed just as much work as the bricks outside. It's followed me along the whole way of my lifetime. It's like Eric said before, it never ends. I mean, in my 20s, it was realizing, wow, I was duplicating the behavior I saw demonstrated in my home. I had to put the plug in the jug myself. I got clean when I was 25. And then in my 30s, it was like a 10-year tet with clinical depression and learning how to handle that. And then it was narcissistic abuse. And I was like a master's athlete, like late in adulthood, doing the marathons. Yeah. And then I spread it out into triathloning to sort of, I thought it would be a good way to, to stave off the injuries of all that running if I spread it out into swimming and biking. And then I was having issues with that. So I, I decided, okay, I'm going to become a naturally ranked master swimmer. And so I hired a couple of Olympians and a world champion and started doing double workouts and training with kettlebells and doing hot yoga for two hours. I mean, it was crazy. I was training like an NC 2A athlete in my early fifties. It's nuts. And within four years had a national ranking as a master's swimmer, because I was looking for that approval from the outside in. And ultimately I couldn't walk around my block and then had to go through that whole odyssey of recovery and all that brought me to look at yet another false persona following. And it's been a bunch of false personas falling away and me having to step up and address truth and embrace it. And therein lies the zero to a hundred dial. And we've talked about it on the show. I am from an athletic standpoint, very much guilty of discovering things like you said, Susan, and rather than dipping my toe in the water and enjoying it for all that it is, I suddenly go to a hundred and I hire some professional coach and suddenly my whole thought pattern is on, I'm going to be this right type of athlete. And the reality is like uh, when childhood PTSD continues to rear its head in one's life, it's usually looking for that affirmation from someone else that we didn't get when we were growing up and we don't realize it. And often by the time we do realize what's going on, it's too late, right? Uh, I don't want to look at the bike anymore. You can't walk around the block anymore. And unless we figure out how to arrest that in its right in its race, we end up casting that aside and doing something else. And that cycle like perpetuates and perpetuates. Yeah, until we come to a place where where our back is up against the wall and then we have to dive deep. And I think that deep dive for me started in my 20s when I got clean, thank God. And that was the level playing field I needed to clear to address more of the issues that would face me. And they rolled in in waves. It didn't all happen at once. And I, they're still rolling. I'm still exploring this human classroom is pretty massive and it's pretty PhD level at this point, even though I feel like I'm still a second grader at some level. I think that's part of what I signed up for as 
an awake and conscious human being. And all these things, including my upbringing and the roles my parents played and the roles my siblings played, have been with perfection. They've been opportunities for me to evolve as a soul. Just next time I'm going to check the fluff and fine print. <laughs> well, I mean, well, it's interesting because it's I, I don't remember signing up for anything. And certainly none of this is my first thought, right? I'm like, I'm here. I'm dealing with it now. But again, I would not have signed this contract probably. But it, it what kept coming to mind, two things. One of them is just a joke. And I'm going to tell you, there's this great meme that goes around. We live in Colorado. If you've ever driven through Colorado, I-70 is our main interstate. And it is some of the most amazing engineering humans have ever achieved. But that shit is a mess. Colorado has some of the worst weather. The you know, construction zones are everywhere. And there's been a meme going around recently that just says, treat yourself like I-70. Just constantly be working on yourself, no matter how much it is inconsiderate of other people's needs and wants. And I was like, so I thought of that when you were saying that. And then the second thing it made me think of is if you sort of come into the Buddhist tradition of understanding karma and how that works and that we are born into this body and into our experience because our soul needs it. I have to be honest. And Eric, this will make Eric laugh because I always catch you with this. I am the sort of cynic. I'm like, eh, woo, whatever. But it's no one would have signed up for this. But at the same time it is sort of the human condition we want something to do right so maybe as instead of just building more and more buildings or the next job or the next thing the next frontier is actually working on ourselves what do you think about that <laughs> is that for me or for susan for anybody i just it just <laughs> occurred let to susan me think, yeah, yeah let susan talk <laughs> i think it's the whole reason we're here i think this other stuff is just distraction And I'm here to move through this evolving stuff to really come from a place of love and feel love. And I truly believe that my challengers and my challenges have been my biggest gifts because that's when I awaken. Sometimes it freaking hurts. It seems unfair and unjust. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I don't know, in the ghetto of the fluffing universe here (laughs) on this planet. But honestly, I think that's my purpose. And now that I've walked through a bunch of stuff, I can be present for other people kind of floundering, going, what the what? Not in that deep space of pain. And what do you, this is interesting, but all New Yorkers in LA and have you had a chance to step back Uh, and look at what impact I can only speak from the New York perspective, living and working in New York city had on your stress level and your mental health and then moving to LA and dealing with it in a different way in LA, different speed and, but still the stress and the, was that something that you were aware of at the time or now can like, like I can look back and reflect and say, wow, I, I have no idea how much that stress was adding to all of these underlying issues that I had growing up. So New York City was my dream. And quite honestly, like this is going to sound like cooey too, but I think I was sent there to get clean. They have an amazing support system. When you're an addict and you're getting clean or you're an alcoholic, there's meetings 24 seven. There's such a strong community. It's If I was in some rural setting, I don't know that I would have had access to the therapist I found who, when I walked into his office sheepishly and said, my life is out of control and completely unmanageable. He immediately started talking about what, how much did, did I drink? Was there alcoholism in my family? I'm like, dude, what the, what I've got problems. Who cares if there's alcoholism in my family? When I drink, I get happy. That's what, come on. And I would have had that in a place that wasn't that big metropolis. But then around year 10 of living there, yeah, I saw that I was becoming a caricature of self. Like every other word out of my mouth started with F followed by you. I was like racing everywhere to get my place in line. And I knew the time was ticking down and I knew it was time to get out. And LA was softer 
because it's sunnier, but I have to say it's an expansive sandbox and you don't know where you stand. In New York, people will tell you straight to your face, no. But in LA, the answer is always yes until it's no. And you don't know where you stand and who your friends are. And it's a one trick pony town, although they're trying to tech it out now. It was all the entertainment business primarily. So I have to say it was nice being so into nature, the hiking trails and all that stuff that you can easily access. I mean, Central Park, beautiful, but only goes so far, right? Yep. It's interesting. I found LA to be way more toxic to me personally. And I think a lot of it for the reason you said, and, and the other bit of it, I think is being having grown up in the Northeast near Boston, and I'm stealing this. Somebody talked about this the other day. They're like, look, like people on the West Coast are nice. But when you need help, they're like, oh, there's probably somebody you can call, right? Where a New Yorker will F you right to your face, but help you change your tire. <laughs> like it's, It is this like different. And there's something interesting. My mom and I had this conversation the other day because she was like, you're nice. And I'm like, mom, I'm not. I was like, I actually kind of hate the word nice. And I was like, it's fine if people think that. I'm not upset about it. I was like, but I'd much rather be thought of as kind. And she was like, well, you are. She's like, you'll help people. And I was like, yeah, that's more important to me. I was like, and people are like, dude, that guy's abrasive. But if I need something, I'll call him. That's the guy I'd rather be. And that's the guy you are. I, it is the guy I am. <laughs> but, and, and it was interesting because like my mom's, well, she's like, I don't like that you describe yourself as not nice. And I was like, mom, I think it's a values question. And listening to you talk about your New York versus LA experience, the thing I felt more than anything in New York is, and this is probably, probably should have been the first clue that I definitely had ADHD, was I finally was in a place where the energy of the place matched the energy inside my head. Mm -hmm. And like you talked about this idea of you're getting clean, there's no better than New York because there's every opportunity, right? I know working in the theater industry and film industry, some of the people I worked with who were in recovery, you know, they, they would get off the stage or finish a production or shooting at 10, 11 o'clock at night. And many of us would go to a bar or go out for dinner. And a lot of them might join us or they go to a meeting. Right. And it's, it is such a different sort of idea of access. And it's, yeah, I wonder if my 20 year old self wouldn't have been able to live the uh, air quote quiet life. I now sort of lead in Colorado because I just wasn't ready for it. My mind wasn't quiet enough or I didn't have it in me to be able to sit on a mountaintop and, and appreciate it for what it was instead of being like, oh, I have to write about this. I have to tell someone this story instead of just being like, no, it's my story. Cool. I'm good. And what's not lost on me is uh, there are two of us who are sitting high up right now in the Colorado Rockies and Susan is sitting out on the vast <laughs> open expanse up in Montana with the beautiful uh, Rockies in the background and skiing across the border about 40 minutes away. And just that whole idea, you hinted toward it and you were talking about, you know, the difference between going out and walking around Central Park and you, you can literally only go so many times around that the reservoir loop before that will actually start to drive you uh, insane. And then in LA kind of hiking and being out there, but again, only so much of that, but now we're all in places where we truly are in nature and we can have these vast experiences and interactions with nature in so many different ways. Yeah, I, I, there's no way I can fight it. I mean, I look out the window and if I wake up in a crap mood, like, how can I? Because the sun is out there or some ominous, beautiful, the sky is as big as they say in Montana. And it just shifts my mood. But I also, I know other people that they'd be freaking out well, and that's we're in our environs. And that was my question, actually. That I, I went on that whole sort of journey of what you were describing and what I've experienced. And I wonder... If we sort of crave the things we crave, and I joke often that like I just kind of followed the path of least resistance, whether it was a job or an interesting opportunity or this or that, and that's kind of how I fell. But I wonder if out of some sort of either divine intervention or just like bizarre habit, 
like our brains kind of crave the places we need at that time. Like you clearly need a New York. I would not be married to my incredible wife if I hadn't left LA and moved back to New York. And so there's these different pieces where the universe kind of leaves these breadcrumbs for us, whatever you believe. I think we're all aliens, but no, I'm just kidding or not. But so there's this sense of, and I wonder in your own journey, where do you think, or, cause obviously you talk about recovery and how important that therapist was. And that clue was sort of like large and in charge. It just kind of took over at that, but you've had some other sort of breadcrumbs along the way. How, how do you find that you have become more aware or more attuned to them? Even though I agree with you, we're still learning that and we could still miss them and make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, those breadcrumbs were big fat croutons ever since my childhood. Just super crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always had that, that little intuitive voice. I'm a super empath, meaning I can pick up on your emotions in two seconds. I can read the room. I know how to respond. I can get into your body and I know what you're feeling. And that has really led me because everything manifested perfectly for my life story, for my trajectory. And I'm grateful that I could pay attention. I mean, like I left the house, I graduated on a Friday night. I left my family house quarter to eight Saturday morning, the next morning. And I knew New York was in my future. It wasn't in the immediate future. I, I went to the Jersey shore where I worked uh, with my sister. And then I went out to school in Ohio and I was 19 by the time I was finally living in Greenwich village on my own. And I was terrified. I was really scared, but I knew I belonged there. And then I went there immediately after college. I just knew I belong in New York. I'm not going to be here forever, but I belong here. And then sort of LA was like, it felt like it was in the picture. And that's like a natural progression for a lot of us, especially in the entertainment industry. You work in New York for a while, usually in TV, some independent film, and then you go to LA for the bigger jobs or more TV, more film. But then that little voice was saying, yeah, you need like space. Yeah, that 5G tower on your neighbor's curb is like a little daunting. Your dog is really freaking out. And yeah, maybe it's time for some more expansiveness like you had in the Catskills. And I really thought it was going to be West Virginia. I really wanted that to happen. I loved Greenbrier County. I, I went there for a junket for Fox and I went to school not far from there, but I got there and it just didn't feel right. There we go again. Like we're feeling now, like I'm feeling now more than ever. And I know, yeah, it's beautiful. Shoot. I could buy outright here, but this isn't right. And I'm not sure what is. And dude, Montana was not on my bucket list. I am like terrified of grizzly bears, just like I was sharks in, in the Pacific. <laughs> and but I flew in over the flathead and man, it was like Camelot or Brigadoon. I'm like, this is it. Like I can feel it, feel it. And that's come as I've taken off the layers of duct tape and gorilla glue and muddy earth that's been around my heart and embraced my battle scars and gone inward. And I can feel now even more than I had before. And that's what's leading me now. And that's what's giving me so much more freedom than I've ever had. There were so many beautiful metaphors there to unpack, but I have to ask you a question because, and it started way at the beginning of you describing yourself and how you react as an empath. And it's something I always want to ask empaths. I resist that I am one. Eric is firmly in the camp that I am. So, but Takes one to recognize. Sure. But one of the things that I've realized about myself that I find the most challenging and I think would be super helpful to anyone listening if they are an empath or a loved one is when were you able to begin to sort when those feelings were yours versus you taking on parts of your environment or things that are going on around you? And I'm guessing that some of this might be wrapped up in surviving a narcissistic relationship. I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up on that road to leave a crouton for you. But I'm wondering, it's okay. You can laugh at me. I'm used to it. I'm thinking there and there may be some crux of when you started to sort that out. Yeah, I have to say it's probably 10 years ago. I knew that I could read people. I knew I was emotionally in tune, but I didn't know what effect that had on my being and my entity. I didn't understand I was sucking an emotion and cleaning it up 
and clearing it out and spitting back at light. But then I did. You just described I... yourself as an em- empathic oyster, which I love, and I'm going to keep <laughs> in my brain forever. You're the o- the emotional oyster. <laughs> <laughs> Can we make T-shirts with that? I'm done. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's sell them and raise some money. We love that. <laughs> and you just say emotional oyster on the back, on the front, and the back. It could be like just the definition of what an empath is, just to educate people. <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> oh my God. So, so I did go to LA. It was for a career move that I thought was glowing, but really it was to meet the greatest guru as in the word teacher of my life. And that's the guy who would become my ex-husband. And I thought this was kismet. Finally, like I found the right one, but really I was just picking from the lowest fruit once again. I was codependent. I needed a man's attention since second grade and Billy Fritz on the playground. And it did not stop. And my friends were like, you're so accomplished. You're really, you can take care of yourself and your family. It's beautiful. Dude, I was like shaken inside. And this guy said all the right things, all the bells and whistles, even though I knew there was a red flag. Hello, hello. I jumped in and then I took on the stuff and I carried it. And every time I would point one finger back, those three fingers would come back to me like that spiritual axiom says, and I'd be fluffed. I'd be staying in that abusive, toxic relationship. And it was my dad. My dad told me I was 12. He said, you're never going to find anybody that can take care of you because your tastes are way too expensive. And so I carried the weight in most of my relationships and was carrying the weight again in this relationship and he would not step up and I was starting to clunk and hiss and I was being sucked dry because an empath is usually attracted to a narcissist and vice versa. So I uh, thought, okay, I don't want to lose my marriage, even though I knew it was well past its expiration date. I'm going to fight heck to keep this together. And I suggested we go to mediation and create a post-nuptial agreement. All I wanted was a little financial integrity in the relationship. And he agreed, much to his credit. We got to the last point. His eyes went in those little slits. He folded his arms. He said, I'm hiring an attorney and I'm filing for divorce. And I heard that intuitive voice that came over my right shoulder and then through my body and said, this is the universe doing for you, but you cannot do for yourself. And We went back to our home that I had bought and paid for and maintained for our family. He took up residence in the master and I, by choice, took a mattress, drug it across the house into the garage, into a partial conversion where I stayed for a calendar year doing the real work to go into my body on a somatic level. Like talk therapy got me so far and I'm grateful for the storyline, but I respond through my body. I hold trauma in my body at a cellular level. And I held no contact. That's the way you escape from a narcissist. No verbal contact and no eye contact. For a calendar year, this was hell on earth. And this was someone I loved. But I was determined. And it was like kismet. It was like all my experience. All I had learned surviving my childhood. All I had learned as an entrepreneur all I had learned getting clean, all I had learned fighting clinical depression and suicide, ideation, all I had learned as a meditator going on silent week-long retreats, holding no contact, all I had learned as an endurance athlete came into play. And within a calendar year, I could write him a six-figure check and he could go on to his next source of supply. And people asked me, why do you call this guy like your guru? Seriously? Oh, Yes. That experience taught me my authentic power. I saw what I could step up and into. And it also taught me self-love and self-respect for the first time. That was the metaphor I needed. That was the billboard that had to fall on me for me to ultimately wake up to what I was accepting in my life. I can understand people resisting the idea that he was a teacher or a guru. What I would offer to people as I'm thinking about it is it was the key to unlocking yourself as your teacher, right? Sometimes we need that 
sledgehammer, for lack of a better set to start to start the work, right? I mean, you're going to demolish a wall. It's the big, ugly tool that comes out first. So, but yeah, because I can see that, right? Because we, we want our teachers and gurus to be benevolent, but they aren't always, right? Sometimes they have to show us something that's already within ourselves. I love it because now you've used Kismet, Brigadoon, Camelot. So we've got all these beautiful musical theater references. But <laughs> it brings me back to something when you were using all of these beautiful metaphors before about removing the mud from how you felt and this idea of Brigadoon. I was thinking about the difference between Camelot and Brigadoon, right? They're both make-believe-ish, right? They're myths. But many people believe that they're myths based in truth, right? Brigadoon could be Atlantis. Camelot could have been a real round table. The question is the difference, right? So Camelot is rooted in earth. It's a place that exists, right? And when I think about an empath, it's a little more ethereal than that. And Brigadoon came from the clouds. And as I think of you up there in big sky, I'm like, of course, she had to go place where there was enough room for that emotional life, right? So here's the question. You said there was red flags you ignored when you first met your guru. When did you realize it? Did you realize it at the time and it was like an inkling sitting in the back of there yelling at you and you were ignoring it? Or was it in that moment when you realized that you had to go through this process to teach yourself that you were like, oh, that was the moment that I should have learned or saw or, and it doesn't matter because you got there, but when, when did it kind of show up for you? I realized the whole way along, but I you shoved did. it under the closest carpet because <laughs> I was so codependent. Yeah. So it was there in the background. Oh God, that's. It, you're just thinking about it too, for you to know that and to even have that inkling all along is even, yeah, it's even harder to accept having to go through it, but I'm glad you did because now you can help other people. And yeah, I'm having, yeah, I'm having this vision now of you, Susan, because the metaphors were amazing and you're in this garage and there's that, you're you're almost mummified and there's that first layer of the duct, the gray silver duct tape that we all know so well. And there's the second layer and Gorilla Glue, which is it's almost, that's almost like Flex Seal at this point, right? You're unable to let anything escape and you finally are. And, and I'm wondering if it was during that year when you were in the garage and you were pulling off all these layers that you were finally able to discover little Susan, right? The inner child within you. And it, was it during that time where you were able to actually help her start to heal, which then led to your own healing journey? I'm so glad you brought that up. So like when I first got clean, Alice Miller's book, Drama of a Gifted Child was out and it was like the thing, it was even appearing in movies. And I did a lot of inner child work but I always like freaking poo pooed it. You know, I, yeah, that's nice, but I don't have time. You know, I got to go run around Central Park three times. Let me out. And it would always come back and up and over in multiple modalities and treatments. But yes, you are right. It was that monastery in the garage where I finally got direct access in an unabashed way. So I didn't feel shame in connecting with her. And I felt authentic connection and love. And that was the transformational piece. And you're right. That has been absolutely pivotal. And I believe that inner child, that light in here is a piece of my soul that's come with me on this walk. The rest of the souls on the other side, like enjoying the show. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful image, but also like slightly cruel in a way, right? Like you get this other, like this other side of yourself being like, oh, look, you're sorting it out. Oh, that's so nice. And I'll be honest, I'm I'm making light of that because that's how I feel all the time in my own head. Eric knows this all the time. Like I'll say something being completely trapped in like my own sort of paradigm of thought process of I've got to get this done and that's important and this and that and Eric would be like, do you really think that's important? I'm like, no, I know it's not. That's what's really messed up. <laughs> There's a part of me sitting over there going, I mean, this doesn't actually matter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's where we end up, right? Like whether it's healing from trauma, uh, recovering from addiction, or unfortunate enough to have our own chemical imbalance that leads to mental injury. I do. I've never, I don't know, Eric, we'd have to go back. I don't know if we've ever had somebody say, 
I thought everything was perfect the whole time, and then it wasn't. I'm like, I don't know if we've ever had that, right? Like, we're not that ignorant to our experience. If we find that person, then that's when we stop the podcast. <laughs> Be right, careful. I think I can I think I can make a delivery on that one. So be uh -oh. careful what you wish for. We don't want them as a guest. Well, no, no, but no. are they aware that there's anything wrong ever? That's the thing. It has to be a turnabout. Yes. Right? Yeah. It has to be that moment of I thought everything was perfectly fine. But well, then... while this whole so to follow on with the garage, we're gonna call it the monastery. The monastery in the house. And <laughs> Here go the light bulbs and chandeliers and nerdy, <laughs> nerdy me. So you refer to yourself as an endurance athlete, right? And so as we know, and, and we were talking about it a little bit earlier, right, these mental health journeys are, are in many ways like an endurance journey and, and it's painful and we need to push through. But I'm wondering, because the first place that you found yourself in was running. And, and you, you were talking about running around New York City, around Central Park three times, which for those of us who live there, we know it's an 18 mile slog, right? So in that initial discovery of endurance running, is that really what it was for you? You were running from something, right? You didn't, it, it wasn't about addressing it. It wasn't about discovering it. It was all about, I've now found this thing and I know I need to be maybe doing this, you said, inner child work, but I don't have time for that because I'm going to go run and I'm going to run as far as I can for as long as I can. And I'm going to run away from something. Because it's faster to run 60 miles. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Is I that? Needed, I needed to be numb, Eric. I mean, you yeah. got to remember my best friend was like, give me any kind of alcohol. I don't care what it is. That's how I knew how to cope. Right. And that's gone. What the what? Of course I'm going to run. And I ran for as long as I possibly could until, <laughs> till I couldn't walk anymore. And I was addressing things as best as I could. And I'm going to give myself a lot of credit. I've done so much work on myself for so long. A lot of that talk stuff, though it was really important for me to get that storyline down after 25 years, that led me full circle straight back to where I was. And I didn't start to really shift in, until I really started to work on a somatic level. Yep. Yeah, it's so true. It's uh, There are so many people that we speak with and from our own experiences where it starts, as you said, with the talk therapy. And then eventually it morphs from just the talk therapy to some sort of, you know, for OCD, cognitive behavioral therapy, whatever it may be. But then you start to realize that the toolbox needs other things and it needs the somatic side of things. And in many instances, I think it's by combining those two are where the real breakthroughs happen. And I think this is a message and it, it's a great message that, that you're delivering. And it's a message for our audience of, and we say this a lot, there's no, there's one, no one right way, but it often is truly that combination of so many different things. It's, we were talking about the blue Hawaiian earlier, putting together the cocktail or making some really amazing dish for dinner with lots of different ingredients. And it's some trial and error and a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that, that allows each of us to be able to discover who we truly are. That's really well said, Eric. And it leads me to this idea, right? So it doesn't surprise me, Susan, having speaking to you, but spoken to you already, but there was an intuitive idea that the body had to be involved, right? Because you wouldn't have been running yourself into the ground if it wasn't. What finally, besides breaking yourself down to the fact that, well, maybe if I swam and ran less, I'd feel better. What pushed you towards actual somatic care that was going to help you heal towards it? Did, was it something you discovered? How did you get in touch or understand? We know, Eric, it was through our wonderful guest, Dana Neural, and going into this idea of Reiki healing and some other stuff you did. But what was your somatic healing path? Oh, I love Reiki healing. So it was that monastery in the garage. I did a narcissistic abuse recovery program that involved something called Quanta Freedom Healing. It's out of Australia. Melanie, Tonya Evans is the healer's name. And you go into your body and you explore the pocket, the color, the texture. Is it current? Is it ancient? Meaning like past 
lineage life down the road because it's in the cells of your being and then you clear it out and then you fill it with light. So that was the first thing that really made the difference. Yeah. And then soon thereafter was when I couldn't walk around the block. So that persona of the endurance athlete fell by the wayside. And I refused to go the Western route because at my age, they're going to say, insert titanium, pass go, $200, well, $200,000. And I I wasn't going that route either. So that led me to a lot of um, therapeutic work and alternative work. I worked with the Sifu. I did Reiki. I did all sorts of things that have combined into me being able to hike and mountain bike and walk around my neighborhood. I, yeah, I was just going to ask, living in Montana with all of the great types of nature therapies that are available, has your body been able to recover to a point where you're able to do other things outside, not from a competitive standpoint and not from an endurance standpoint, but purely for the joy of being out there and taking it all in? Yeah, the universe gave me that <laughs> that gift. It was foisted upon me and I rebelled for as long as I could. But yeah, I don't have a choice. I have to really take care. I'm still rehabbing in a way. I have much more strength. My it, The hip is a huge joint and that's where it attacked and it had atrophied. So I've had to do a lot of work, but now like I can't even imagine jumping into the pool at the Rose Bowl at 5.30 a.m. when it's 38 on deck and it's 76 in the water and you're freezing your AI. Seriously. No, I feel like some gentle yin this morning and fluff the walk. I ain't going on it. Maybe I'll go hiking later. But that's so different. Before it was like, "Mm, check it off. Yeah. Did the bike, did the run, did the... Yeah, it's so different now. It is. And Eric can tell you during his, even part of our friendship, he was still racing. And I'm like, well, why do you feel the need to do that to yourself? And by the way, I'm not being critical. I, because yeah. I, Eric knows, like I've run trail races. I've done some incredibly insane things physically as well, but there is a point where it's, are you doing this for the joy and the purity of doing it? Or are you trying to fill some sort of hole? Or do you think you just deserve this abuse? Like <laughs> there, there could be different <laughs> answers to that question. And it is... It is so wonderful to hear how you describe your relationship with your body and how it feels and exercise now, right? Because it's how we should all feel. Now, granted, if every day you wake up and you're like, oh, should I take a walk? And the answer is always no. You might want to investigate that a little bit more. But if it is, no, I'm a little tired. I'm feeling a little creaky today. Yeah, I should do some slow fo yin or maybe some restorative yoga and then or what is always the answer for me when it cools off, I'll go back outside. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I want to address what you had brought up, Mark, because I want to also hear Susan's response to this as an endurance athlete, a lot of running, a lot of swimming for me, mountain biking and mountain bike races, cross country races. And, and I think a lot of it as I look at it is I, it, not only did I embrace the pain, but I enjoyed the pain and I wanted to go there and I still do, but now I do in a different way. I think there was a time where I went there because the pain was really the only time where I could show myself that I was truly worthy and that I could almost ground myself in the world right? The rest of the time, it was always anxiety and OCD and all these things going on. But when that when the pain came, I had to focus on that pain. And I had to push through that pain. And whereas now, when I go out and if I decide to really push it, or it's only to see, do I still have that ability to do it? And it and in some ways, it's kind of fun, but I don't spend my I don't even spend my entire life there or my whole life there. And I have nothing to prove anymore to myself or to other people. So I'm curious, Susan, for you, how did it manifest itself? Yeah, I so identify with your trajectory, Eric, and thanks for putting it out so blatantly. Because I too, I had the same thing, especially when I was going after that national ranking in swimming, I would just go to kettlebells and go through this and people would just look at me and I was super ripped and just a perfect specimen and could not take it in at all could not appreciate it. 
And so to really be able to drop that false construct and see why, and I don't have a desire anymore to know that's who I can be. It's I'm in a new zip code. That's all I can describe it as. I I just, yes, I am living in a place I never knew and didn't think that Physically and spiritually, I will. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, because it it is that thing. It's funny that we kind of keep coming back to this of like how we find place, right? When And you've spoken to it, not specifically, but it's something we speak about a lot on this podcast. and, And we speak so much about community, right? And you've talked about these certain people along the way that have been either your guides to their positive or their negative ilk. We can give credit on both sides. But I don't know. We've talked about headspace and being in it but i think this is the first time where we've really talked about like how our environment is such a main part of our community right eric i mean we, it, it yeah. comes up but and i think it's probably because we do have some parallels here between the three of us and places we've lived and the similarities but it is interesting because i often think of it but not in i've never tried to put it into words or really sort of distill it the way we have here and it's it, it is interesting that we can find your inner peace is inner, but it can be affected by that outside environment. And I mean that more generally, right? Obviously, if you're in a toxic relationship or a toxic household or a living situation, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the general noise of life, right? Being on the train every day versus walking to work. And it was something I discovered in New York when it was nice out. The majority of my work for about two years was actually in Union Square, which was almost 70 blocks from my apartment. And I would often walk one of the ways and everyone thought I was crazy. And those are some of my, be- and even thinking of it now, some of my best days and best memories of living in New York city came from that walk or just in that day. And I didn't realize it then, but at the time that's, I was finding that sort of peace, even amongst the noise of walking down third Avenue on the way down Union square. And, and it really just occurred to me. So Susan, I can't thank you enough for that. It was really cool to kind of, wrap my head around that uh, a new way. Well, I think a lot of it too gets to the, I'm going to come back to the inner child because when the inner child is hurt physically or emotionally is suppressed and isn't allowed to be a child, right? Children play, have fun, have all these great experiences. When you don't have that ability to do that as a child, sooner or later in life, that inner child wants to come out. And so here you are, Montana here, Mark and I are Colorado. And that inner child like wants to play and wants to have fun. And so it wants to ski and it wants to mountain bike and it wants to go for hikes. And, and it's whether it's when somebody's 20 or when somebody's 40 or when somebody's in their fifties, like I am, that when that inner child comes out and it really takes hold and it actually gets to connect and play with the adult version and you almost morph, right? So the adult becomes the, the child. That's when the, that's when real joy and real happiness takes over your life. So that, that's kind of my, that's my own thought on what you were just kind of talking about when it comes to environment. It's a hundred percent right. And Eric, if you think about it, how often, um so susan my wife and i never had children and people are always like oh you guys would be such great parents why didn't you have kids and my wife usually just points at me and she's have you met my 235 pound toddler like Mm -hmm. how do you think that would go and i never thought of it that way eric because i always was like yeah i'm kind of a goofball immature and do sort of crazy things but i guess without even really realizing it i i've embraced my inner child so much that it's just my persona now (laughs) well and if you think about it why not? Right? Our, I mean, there's so many euphemisms and amalgams we make for this of out of the mouths of babes or like whatever it is, but it's like, there is wisdom in that. Oh, you want to go do that? Go do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else and it's not hurting yourself, if it brings you joy, yes. And I think about how often even myself, and I hope I'm not the only one guilty of this, who I feel like has done a lot of work to become more self-aware and understand my own needs and thoughts. But it's, yeah, I'm still like, oh no, I have to do this. And I'm going to share a friend of mine recently was like, well, I think when you get mired or things are really hard, he's, this is the perception change I want you to make. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you don't have to do it. 
you get to do it. And I think I shared that with you a couple weeks ago, Eric, and it's been really profound for me. Like, even when I'm in my worst mood and I'm like, why? Like, you even made, you made a, a reference to it very early on, Susan, about I have to be like, I got to go do this. And I thought of it. I was like, she's not a have to girl. She's a get to girl. I can already tell. And when I make that statement, what does that make you think of? I mean, I'm seeing this incredible smile come out of you. So I know it's giving you some sort of a great thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I am. Th- people like just some of them like recoil in horror <laughs> when they like hear the title of my book or they, they learn more about me. Dude, like I am really embracing <laughs> this world. And I've always had that spark of light in me, always shining. There were moments where it got pretty dim there. And I thought, it, yeah, it could snuff out if I don't step up to the plate. But I've always had that childlike quality and well into adulthood. And I've always been curious and I've always asked a lot of questions. It can be kind of annoying. I'm surprised I haven't asked you guys more questions in our conversation, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that aspect and quality. And it's a privilege to hear you guys talk about it so openly. Thank and you can you. ask us any questions you want. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we haven't given you much opportunity because you've sparked so many thoughts in us that we've just been like stream of consciousness. Oh my God, I just thought of this thing. So you've asked questions without asking them. Like you've made these wonderful statements and stories about your own life and it's sparked so much in us. I mean, just watching us, and that's what made me laugh is watching us all physically through these little weird boxes we're talking through and how much our bodies are moving and responding when everyone else is talking. It's It, it just reminds me of how important this is. Like Eric and I talk all the time of what are our goals? What are we trying to do here? And really, Susan, everything you shared is just so in line with it, which is there are ways, there are many, find them, go do it. And guess what? You're going to get to some awesome place, then you're going to realize you got more work to do. So here we go. <laughs> and, and your story um, shares that so much. And I cannot wait, wait to read the book. And I can't believe how pertinent it is uh, to be speaking to you today after having, I, cause my mom and I had some pretty deep um, conversations just about that and about the work still needs to be done. And, but I'm going to say, instead of needs to be done, we get to do the work. We get to be a little bit better today than we were yesterday. And that's, I need more of that. So thanks for reminding me of that. (laughs) So where can people find the book? Where can people find you and connect with you? Because I know our audience probably has a thousand more questions than Mark and I could possibly come up with. First, I just want to say, wow, what an amazing opportunity it's been to talk to you guys. Thank you. I know this takes energy. It takes finance. It takes a lot of research to to do these episodes. And what you're putting out, the content you're putting out is so valuable and so meaningful. And this conversation today has made me a fuller human being. I feel really grateful to be on the planet. So thank you. I'm going to tear up. If you, just people teared, feel... you just teared me up, girl. <laughs> if thank if you. people feel... Yeah, sure. If people feel drawn, just go to susangold.us. Everything's there. The book's at the regular place, Amazon, all that crap. But um, yeah, (laughs) susangold.us is the place. You you can buy it from Bezos, but please go to her website. (laughs) I'll translate for you, my dear. (laughs) I just, and just to echo, because if you can hear it in my voice, I am teared up a little bit. It means a lot. And it means a lot in general, but in specifics, without people like you reaching out, sharing your story. And then the next step, the step that Eric's taken and you've taken, and I haven't yet and may or may not, is to then make that next step of, I'm going to reach my hand out to help. And I've done that singly. There are many people that I have either mentored or just been there as an ear. And I think that's the other important thing too. It doesn't have to go, I'm congratulating you and thanking you both for all the amazing work you're doing, but it doesn't have to go that far. If there's someone in your life that's just struggling, just be there. Let them know you care. Let them know you love. And that's it. That might be all they need forever. Never mind like that. Because I think it's easy to be like, oh, that's the first step. It might be the only step they need to be like, oh, yeah, no, I belong here. There are people who need me. So I just, that's it. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Susan for your very kind words, for your for your time and being on the show today. It's amazing. From the first time that you and I got on and chatted, there were so many connections going all the way back to 
our childhood and, and different career paths, but similar lived experiences throughout. And, and I thank you for the emails that I get from you with kind, such kind words. And for someone who has always had a difficulty in accepting thanks and it, it truly means a lot. Um, and, and I'm not kidding. I'm going to come up to Montana <laughs> and beg. <laughs> he doesn't kid. I mean, he kids, but not about things I like kid, that. but not about that. I may fly. I, to be he honest, I don't like to drive. I'll probably fly. But, or or uh, get me to drive and we'll get there faster. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all kidding aside, Susan Gold, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to get to know you this little bit today. And I look forward to getting to know you more. And as I'm sure you and Eric have talked about before, you're in the family now. So you got to live with us, good or bad, you're in. You're part of the From Survivor to Thriver family and and uh, and we're all better for it. Eric, anything else? I'm going to leave it with that, Mark. Welcome to the family. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Susan Gold, our incredible guest. This is Mark Fernandes from Survivor to Thriver, episode 134. And of course, on behalf of my incredible co-host, Eric DeRosa, pink toenails and all, I say this as I always do, and I'll leave us with these words. Let's all please be as well as we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.